How you doing? Uh, welcome to Chronic Briefs, everyone. This is our first official interview episode. I told you we were going to have a new type of episode this season, and here it is. Uh, and of course, our first guest is the amazing Kat Elton, one of my good friends. So, Kat, how you doing? Welcome today. Thank you for doing this. Uh, Kat has put up with all kinds of technical tests, just so you know, and all kinds of... <laughs> this is like the fourth call, so our heart goes out to you, and thank you for helping us set this <laughs> no all up. Uh, I'm just glad you're the one having to do that part and not me. <laughs> I know. I'm trussed up like a turkey here with all these wires, so let's hope it works. Okay. Cat Elton, RA hero, tell us, I guess, you know, the whole spiel, a little bit about yourself, like everybody asks, just so we know what we're dealing with. Okay. Um, diagnosed at two and a half years old, I was the first one in the family to stand and jump and do everything until everything changed at two and a half years. And I decided, found out I had JRA. Yeah. So that ruined my sporting career, yeah, I think. I know. Um, I know. And then, <laughs> And now I'm um, I'm not 21 anymore. I've had two, I've had JRA for 48 years, oh boy. and um, I managed to have an occupational therapy career for part of that time. And once that became too hard, I started writing books. So I have a couple books for people with arthritis. Yep. And most recently, I've been writing for rheumatoidarthritis.net along with you, Daniel. Yes. <laughs> and um, I'm helping out with the RA Guy Foundation and co-hosting a podcast called RA Guy and Friends, a Curiously Hopeful Podcast. A Curiously so Hopeful So that's podcast. what I've been up to lately. I love it. That's great. Um, <laughs> you know, it's some, something, and we've talked before, we, we talk often, but uh, something I never asked you is what was it like to have an occupational therapy career? You, I assume you treated people with RA, right? In your... Yeah. And, and, yeah. And what was that like? I mean, did it help you get closer to the patients? I can only imagine that it did, right? It was it was a blessing and a curse at the same time, because obviously, JRA will impact my ability to do things physically. So I wasn't necessarily the best technician, you know, like when I'm when you're having to move people's arms who've had a stroke and they're 250 pounds oh, yeah. and I'm 95 pounds soaking wet. <laughs> I wasn't great at that part, but I was, but the arthritis really, really helped with the, their, you know, the therapeutic relationship, helping people to help themselves, help giving people the idea that there's potential for themselves, even if they just got struck down with something really difficult. It was, it really helped because here they see me yeah, and they see me coming in. And even if I'm not saying anything, you know, I may be limping or I may, they can see my hands and see it's not, everything's perfect over there. So um, it really helped that way. It really helped that way. And I think that um, as a result, I definitely helped with the compassion and the ability to help yeah. people, the emotional part, well, help, I think, help people understand they can do yeah, it. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when they get diagnosed, my life is over, what am I going to do? Uh, yeah. I'm not going to be able to work, I'm not going to be able to yeah. do anything, and you were living yeah. proof that that was not true. You know, Right, you were, and, and I'm doing the things that I'm t telling them they need to do. Right. When it's people with arthritis, I'm saying, listen, this helped me a lot. And so I can, I'm already like test testing out the ideas and you know on on real time from my in my life <laughs> so i know what's good and what's not that great some of these um wonderful tips and tricks are sound good on paper but in real life they're not necessarily that useful yeah but others are yeah, very true. good and so again <laughs> well you know what works and what doesn't work you've already tested exactly. out what sucks exactly. and what doesn't suck so you've got the edge <laughs> there so tell me about this ra guy podcast i didn't know that you were doing that actually even though we talk so much yeah it's um something we started two years ago this year 2020 because 2020 is the upside down yeah. year tell and me about we it didn't really, we didn't, yeah we didn't do any this year but we have a really good set of podcasts for next year and really what we talk about is the emotional impact how to handle the emotional side of things not not the physical part because again the emotional part really isn't talked about as not much all, and, it's, yeah. and sometimes a lot harder and more crippling than the physical aspect of the disease 100 so just having a couple people and people we bring people in and interview them and even my mom was on it so my mom's famous now <laughs> 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 so it's really fun and i think uh, it's informative and i think it will help uh, i i've seen ra guy i don't know him personally but i know he's been around for a while 
doing yeah. doing what he does. And uh, I think yeah. he has a foundation too, right? All right, got yeah, foundation. Yeah. Yeah, that's when I started helping yeah. out when he did that. Oh, that's great. I, and when is it? it next yeah. year you said it's coming out? Yeah, I would guess February would be the first one. Okay. We'll probably do that. Yeah. And yeah. I know you've written a few books, right? I saw on your website. How, uh, what was it? Well, I'm sorry. Remind me the title of the first one again. Rheumat um, rheumatoid arthritis, learning to thrive, not, oh my <laughs> God. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's called A Resilient oh, Life. Oh. Learning to thrive, not just survive with rheumatoid. My first book's called A Resilient Life, Learning to Thrive, Not Just Survive with Rheumatoid Arthritis. Again, a mouthful. Well done. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Woo, I got that out. It was so much easier writing the book than just saying that. Yeah, right I, there, know, so. I know. People are going to watch this and they're going to say, why are they laughing so much about the title coming out? Exactly. <laughs> Must be a comedy. Must be a comedy. It is a comedy. <laughs> Living with this disease is a comedy. Oh my God! I know is. exactly. Speaking of, it's a comedy of errors. Right. So that's speaking for sure. of, let's get to the first of the three questions: the most absurd or embarrassing thing you have experienced due to your illness. You know, it's it, rheumatoid arthritis gives you a lot of opportunities to answer that question. I know. <laughs> yeah. I made a career about it. Here. Just like you, I read an article you wrote once called. Um, my hands hate me and my hands hate me too. So I can relate on that one, but that's just daily life. That's not like an extreme story. So I have a good one good, for you. Good. <laughs> when, I was, when I was in my 20, early twenties, I had this cr a crush on this Australian guy. I went to Australia to visit him. We went to this town called Toowoomba, which sounds like a lot of Australian okay. towns. And we went to a party at one of his friend's house. <laughs> So again, I'm trying to impress all these people I don't know. The friend's house, the friends, it was their, actually their parents' house. The house was covered in white, beautiful white shag carpet, the entire place, right? So I get the tour, we put on some music. It's, it's summertime in Australia, so shoes are off because you have to take care of that carpet. We're dancing around. I think I know where this is and all going. And I look down. <laughs> I look down and I see something that horrifies me and it's blood. So you know that if you take a lot of aspirin, you just leak blood. Yeah, you know, you can just like, you know, touch there. a feather yeah. and it, yeah. So I'll, somewhere along the way, and unfortunately early on, but you know, in the, in the visit, I had uh, gotten a scratch of some sort. So there were bloody footprints everywhere oh. around the shag, white shag carpet. As soon as I looked down, everybody <laughs> else looked down and managed to see it and they were horrified. Oh so picture about 20 people <laughs> dabbing at this white <laughs> carpet, frantically trying to get the, the blood out, asking me if I had AIDS because it was like during the, when AIDS was first oh coming out and they were like, oh no, what if she has AIDS? Now, needless to say, I didn't see those people after that <laughs> and I didn't, that crush did not work out. You know that, you, so, know, you know that now, that was pretty no fun. matter what happened to that guy, at every Thanksgiving, someone brings up. Remember you dated a bloody footprint girl? <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. Who gets a white shag carpet and doesn't expect it to stay new? Expects it to stay new for more than a month. It's a white shag carpet for God's sake. Well, the, going back to the hand part, I was already worried about that white shag carpet right. as I got in because I knew I was going to spill something. Of course, you all the time. So. <laughs> you know, it's your, uh, I just didn't know it was going to be blood. <laughs> Couldn't it, even red wine like would have been better, but no, you're just like, yeah, I'm exactly. gonna go for broke blood. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I I really don't know what happened to it, and I hope they didn't have to replace the carpet. Well, like you know what? Serve them right for getting a white shag carpet. Okay, <laughs> talk about an instance that sticks out in your mind where your disability. Well, this is for you, probably too many to answer. Where your disability slash chronic illness allowed you to help someone or make the world better in some way. Um, I mean, you are an OT, so kind of, that was your entire career, to be honest. <laughs> I have a good OT story, actually. Okay. I can think of one. So I was one time, one of my jobs was in a, a acute rehabilitation in a hospital floor, okay? So those are actually, those are really hard jobs. I didn't last very long. <laughs> But I didn't last long, especially because there was a physiatrist who's the, the like basically the leader of the floor, a doctor, and he loved to gossip about the patients in our um, conference room. 
and he loved to gossip in a not a very nice way. So you can imagine someone who'd been a patient a lot in their life coming into these staff meetings, hearing all this negative gossip about oh, people God. that I was working with and I really liked. So that was my mindset coming into these meetings. So one day we were in a meeting and there was this woman on the floor who had had a surgery that was bad and went septic. And they were talking about her and they were talking again, joking, not in a great way. She really wanted to go to her class reunion. It was like a 50 year reunion or a four, it was an important one to her. She was bound and determined to go to that reunion. And um, it would kill her. Like it was obviously going, she was not gonna survive that. And so everyone's going around the table saying, who's gonna talk to her and joking about it. And I started to get really angry because like, this is important and someone needs to have a real conversation. So I just said, got up, I said, I'm gonna do it and I left. I, and so I went and I talked to her and I just said, listen, I know you wanna do this. I've had to miss so many important things in my life because of my arthritis. And if you do it, if it's important, that important for you, that you're, you're okay for that to be the last thing that happens in your life, then do it. But otherwise, please stay here so we can heal you and maybe you can connect with those people in a different way later, right? So I did that, I walked out and she did hear me. She didn't go, she came out of the hospital. She came back six months later and she said, she's saying thank you to everybody and she looks at me she said hey there's that little girl that came into my my room and she was shaking in her boots and her face was all red and she was talking to me and, and she convinced me not to go to the reunion she gave me a big hug she said thanks for that and it was really I was really glad that I could do that because I can imagine what if someone else had done that it wouldn't quite have quite yeah gone quite the well, same obviously. way obviously <laughs> and you know it goes without saying and I know that people might not know this who aren't chronically ill but you know we are some of the most empathetic people in the world i don't know if it just comes with the territory automatically or if we grow into it but empathy seems to be one of the things we do well i think we grow into it because we there are so many things we can relate to we can relate to pain acute or chronic pain we can relate to loss of function and we can relate to it either slow loss of function yeah. or like really quick because you know some days you wake up and you just can't walk all yeah. of a sudden oh, yeah. so we can relate to so many we can relate to unpredictability <laughs> we can relate to challenge we can relate to being clumsy yeah. all these things we can relate to <laughs> you're right 100 percent. so yeah empathy will grow if you walk in someone's shoes yep. often okay last one and i think probably most important something good for you personally that has come out of your chronic illness something good something positive yeah and i think it's the empathy that would be my okay. answer it's empathy good. and okay. um perspective well, that ties it up nicely in a bow Look at I know, that. Right? <laughs> I know, right but i'd say that both of those like it, it really is nice to be able to have deeper connections with people and also perspective you know where they say attitude is everything right. And it really is. And I think that when you live with rheumatoid arthritis or chronic illness in general, you really, you have a lot of decision-making constantly, like, cause you're always having to adapt to whatever's happening to you. So you got to go to worst case scenario. You got to go to like, what do I want to happen? And then like, what would be ideal to happen in this situation? I think that we've been in enough worst case scenario situations that that's not as scary anymore. Yeah. And I also feel like if you have to make these decisions all the time, you get the goalpost better for like what to aim for. So you're not disappointing yourself so 100%. much all the time. And it's all about perspective too. Like if you get disappointed, then you just kind of like, you have to shift and in, in, as we go and, and deal with certain realities that we don't want or and or flipping things on their side. So we see that there is a silver lining somewhere. Oh so I think those are really good skills. They're life skills that you can use for everything, not just for the arthritis. 100% what I've been saying. Yeah. It, it expands beyond the chronic illness disability arena, 100%, which is why Definitely. I think so many people can relate to these type of things, including your podcast. Thank you, the incomparable Cat Elton. Give us the name of the podcast again. It's coming out next year. R.A. Guy and Friends, a curiously hopeful podcast. Wonderful. And then we will make sure to listen. <laughs> Thanks again for being on and being my first guest and putting up with all the technical ridiculousness <laughs> that it took to get this working. 
And thank you. I love you.